Uh, good evening. We're going to start our presentation. Um, my name is uh, John Notable. I am from Warren City, Iowa. I work at Maintainer in Sheldon. Um, good place to work, right, Adam? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, uh, we are here tonight to talk to you guys about drones. Uh, we are both uh, drone pilots. We do uh, drone racing, um, drone freestyle, and just kind of hobbyist drone as well. Um, this is Nate, I'll let him introduce yep. himself. Um, I'm Nate Sito, I am from North Sioux City, South Dakota, and I'm 17 years old. I go to Dakota Valley High School up there in North Sioux. And I've been into this drone thing since I was about 14. 14, 15, I started to get into the drones and I do Basically, I just do drone racing and drone freestyle right now. And we're gonna to explain to you all the different aspects of what types of drones you can look for with what you wanna do with it. And yeah, we just do yeah. So, uh, we have a couple different types of drones that we're gonna go over tonight. Um, first one that we would like to talk about would be like the professional photography. Then we'll get into kind of the hobby. Um, and from there, we're gonna get into probably more in depth with the FPV racing and freestyle drone. That's a lot of the custom build, um, a lot more hands-on tech stuff that we all enjoy. Mm -hmm. And examples for each of them. So like for aerial photography, you can get, this is a DJI Phantom 3 standard. This is mine, I use it just for simple aerial photography that I'm doing in between flights. Yep. And John does fully autonomous builds. And Yeah, this is one I way. built, it's a fully autonomous GPS um, it's got a three-axis gimbal, 360 degrees, retractable legs, fun stuff. Um, this one uh, I've been using for probably about a year now. Um, it is, it does give uh, live video feedback, so I have uh, the pilot can be operating it, and we we have a camera operator as well that will then um, control the camera and the gimbal, and they'll be using a screen, basically, um, and then just giving kind of, um, you know, verbal feedback and stuff like that. But you can operate it as a pilot and put it into like a loiter and then operate the gimbal independently of the drone while it stays in um, that loiter mode. So, uh, moving on, we'll go to Nate, we'll tell you about his DJI yeah. a little so, more. The DJI, you can do anything from hobbyist to professional aero photography. This drone itself was $500. It has a 3-axis stabilized gimbal camera. It's, it films in 2.7K video resolution, so that's pretty high quality for only $500. And you get a flight time of around 25 minutes, and you can get anywhere from you know, a few hundred feet. You can go almost a half mile away with these ones, but with the new Phantom 4 Pros, you can get anywhere up to six miles away from where you're at. And it does do live video feed from the Wi-Fi in here to the Wi-Fi on your phone. So you can kind of see where you're looking at with the gimbal and you can control the gimbal through the, the transmitter, which I don't have right now, but yeah. You can get some pretty good quality videos and photos out of this. You can spend anywhere from $500 to 1300 to three grand. It just depends on what level you're at yeah. and what level you're comfortable with. The DJI Phantom 3 standards, I think you can get uh, refurbished, which is comes with a full factory warranty. It's just ones where somebody bought a drone and they're like, I don't like a drone and I don't want a drone anymore. So they send it back and you can get those for around $356 now, I believe. So that's good money. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, this, is, this is called the Spider 550 frame. Um, you'll see, uh, the numbers associated with drones and to put that in perspective uh, that's how you size the drone that's millimeters from the back left motor to the front right motor and vice versa so when you see people talking about their drones they'll say like okay this is a ZMR 250 this is a Spider 550 then the RS 900 that is the distance between and that's kind of how us in the drone community kind of size up what what we're talking about when we don't have our drone on us or we just want to explain it to somebody. Um, but this runs on uh, open source. Uh, it works with a program called Mission Planner. So before I go out on a job, I can pop up my computer, I can just plug it into my USB port on the side, and I can input the coordinates and I can set different waypoints 
and then tell it what azimuth I want it to focus on. Um, so it will fly itself and I can tell it how fast I want it to be traveling or I can tell it at what time in the flight I want it to arrive there. So you can either, so then you can kind of set up a video where if you want to circle a certain area and you want your video to be five minutes long, you can set it to be like, all right, I want to land in five minutes and all these waypoints will be within that time. And it'll calculate the amount of time and do the speed accordingly. Um, it's, it's really, a, it's a, it's a hands-on build. Um, from the ground up, uh, but it, it does offer a lot of controls and features. Uh, Mission Planner is a very robust program, <coughs> um, and it's like I said, it's open source, so you can you can modify quite a bit on these things. So, and now into this is kind of my favorite. This is what I really like: <coughs> racing quads and freestyle quads. You can get anywhere from. I have this little baby FPV quad that I made. It's I think. 85 millimeters motor to motor. This thing is more indoors and you can get QX90s, QX95s or that size and you can get all the way up to um, 190 size quads. This is my racing quad that I bring to races and that's my freestyle quad right there. That's a QX210 so it's two, 210 millimeters from motor yep. to motor and that one has a GoPro on it. It's a little heavier and this one doesn't have a GoPro. This is probably the lightest build you can do. And the lighter it is, the faster it usually goes based on the thrust of the motor and propeller, which we'll get into more later. You can get any size, anywhere from 80 millimeter to 250 millimeter, like that one there. You can get anywhere in between. You can get anywhere from 45 miles an hour to 80. And I think the fastest drone, racing drone that I've seen or heard of is 130 miles an hour. Just straight drag racing. <laughs> You don't really get much control going 130 yeah. miles an hour, but it's still pretty quick. And the thing with the electric motors, like it's not like five, six seconds. Like the power's now. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no motor no drag. drag. It's there's just no it instant. So. Yep. And with these, as with the DJI, you get about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how vigorous you're flying with these. You can get anywhere from two minutes to four minutes. Four minutes is pretty max. You're running these. You're running a lot of amps through these little baby motors, and those batteries can barely handle it sometimes. And yeah. depending on how hard you're flying, you can you can get very little flight time. Yeah. Get in the. Yeah. Um, and then I think uh, when we get done, we were we we're going to show you guys some of the freestyle stuff too. If you guys aren't squeamish, <laughs> um, but we're but these are these are some of the guys that we watch. We watch Rotor Riot. Mr. Steel is a great. Um, is probably one of the best pilots out there when it comes to freestyle. And this is my sole freestyle quad. I actually, I do a GoPro on it. It's actually really risky because crashing will obviously break it. I've actually broke one already. It's a little heavier, but it's meant to do flips and rolls. Can you so, show that video? Yeah, we can, okay. we, can, we can probably show that video. <laughs> but yeah, this is meant to be inverted, you know, rolls, flips, all that kind of stuff. It's really nimble. They're, they should be. It, they move pretty quick, but this one you won't see the 80 mile an hour flight speeds because it's not meant for speed, it's meant for being nimble in the air, yeah. being upside down and whatnot. And this is my freestyle one. It's a 250 ZMR. Um, it's, it's actually the second one I have and I don't think anything here is original parts. So that's how we fly them. Yep, you will crash, it's a guarantee. If you get into racing, it, you will, or any drones, you will yeah. break your first one. We build them to it's, break them, it's, it's a, kind of our motto. It's a guarantee, you'll break the first one you build and you'll break all the ones you build actually. Yep. Don't get upset, <laughs> just warning you. Um, now we're gonna get into building. Uh, some of the things we're gonna cover are the motors, the ESCs, the electronic speed controllers. Um, we have a few various flight controllers that I brought um, for you guys to come up and check out afterwards if you have any questions. Um, we're going to have a good Q&A after this. Uh, we'll talk about batteries, uh, power distribution boards, um, on-screen displays, and cameras and video transmitters. That's probably the biggest part of this part. <laughs> and with, with this, the parts, the parts list, it doesn't apply just to these racing quads. You, you will see all of these parts integrated even into the big Phantoms or the Spider 550s or the RS 900s. All the components are the same in all of them. You just get 
bigger parts depending on what you're using them for, basically. Yeah. That's actually the original package that I purchased when I built this. And yeah, none of the parts are the same anymore now that I realize that. So, um, getting into motors, uh, there, there are hundreds of different motor sizes. Um, and you'll see on the side it has the MT number and the KV number. Um, the, M, the MT number is on the bottom of every motor there is a certain sized um, mounting bolt pattern. So the MT tells what size the motor is and also what bolt pattern that you'll require for it. So the smaller the first two digits, the smaller the motor, that's kind of the diameter. And uh, the, the last two digits um, will tell you what bolt pattern you'll use on the bottom of your arms. Um, now the KVs, that is uh, essentially the red line of your motor. Um, it is basically the RPMs per volt that you can get out of it. So that one there has like a max of 2300. Um, these motors I have here are 2600 or 2600 race specs. Um, and these are the, these are the 23s. This is actually the same motor as that. Um, but they, they also come ranging from what amount of voltage they can uh, use as well. And we'll get into that more later with the batteries. Mm -hmm. So, anything else? No, that's perfect. Okay. So, ESCs, you'll, that's kind of a, not really a slang term, more of an acronym for electronic speed controls. I like to think of it kind of thinking of how the human body works. You have the brain that sends the signals through your like nervous system and stuff like that. This is kind of that, it turns the inputs from your controller into kind of commands or electrical pulses that go to the motors. It converts the DC power from the batteries into alternating current power. Since these are brushless motors, they do require um, alternating current, and that that is what these little things do. And you can get them anywhere from 20 amps to 50 amps to 100 amps based on how many amps you're pulling. And yeah, that's really all they are. If you they're rated at 30 amps. If you, you can pull 30 amps continuously, but you can pull 40 amps for 10 seconds. But if you pull the 40 amps for more than 10 seconds, you will see them tend to explode. Some of the resistors can't handle the power and they will explode and fry. It lets out the magic white smoke. Yep, and you can, <laughs> basically, basically. You gotta keep that in there, otherwise it don't work. And these are, these three examples we have on here are rated probably, you know, best quality mm -hmm. to better quality to kind of what we started on. Afro ESC is something I started on. I think a lot of us did. Yeah. Little B ESCs, I still use those. And KISS ESCs are kind of top of the line. It has proprietary software. You can only use that specific software. I like it personally. It's, it's all preference. It's all preference. But yeah, you can, each individual ESC can range anywhere from like $10 a piece. And the KISS ESCs are about 20 bucks, 24, 25 bucks a piece. And you need one for each motor. Yeah. Good. Um, then you get into the brains of the system. I brought a few flight controllers here. Um, this, I'll just start with this one. This is the, the Pixhawk flight controller. This is fully autonomous. It's got a built-in CAN system, a closed area network. Um, it's got multiple UART controllers. You have USB. You can hook up two different telemetries and as well as multiple GPS. Um, it's got buzzer switches that you can hook up to it. But it comes with, um, on this side, you have a single input, because it uses a PPM uh, controlling. So all the signals that are coming from your transmitter are powered through one wire. And then it has the motor outs, and then you have, you have eight motor outs, so you can run up to a octocopter with this. And then you have six auxiliary outs. And what this does, this is, this is the brains of your entire drone. Um, it tells the ESCs how much power to give each motor based off of information that it's getting back from your GPS, your telemetry, um, your battery, and your throttle from your transmitter. So if your transmitter is telling it, I want you to go forward, it's telling which motors to make it go forward and keep it level at the same time and keep it at a certain tilt. So. It basically 
It regulates the power to the ESCs, therefore regulating the motors and keeping keeping your drone in the air. So, and you can program these to different uh, PID settings. If you, I'm not getting into that. Um, <laughs> That's a little that, more advanced. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can you can program it so that your 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 flight controller flies the way you want it to feel. If you feel it's getting a little laggy in a certain area, you can back it off a little bit and adjust it to your own flying needs. Oh gosh, propellers. This, propellers for racing quads, there's definitely a huge market for these. There are tons of brands you can buy from, but I'm just gonna go with the simple, like the numbers of them. So these that I have on here are called 5040 props. They are, they're tri-blade obviously, but so 5040 is kind of the numbers you hear, it's uh, like, so the 50 part is it's five inches in diameter. You can get anywhere from like three inch props to probably 22 inch props, depending yeah. on what you're running. And then the 40 is the pitch. So you see this airfoil right here, how much it's pitched up. And that 40 means in one rotation, it will move, I believe it's four feet. It's, that number is pretty, uh, pretty, it's pretty accurate yeah. based off of the degree of the pitch. And then I have these, as you can tell, the airfoil on these is a little more intense. These ones actually are 50-51 props. So the 50-51, the 51 is, it'll go 5.1 feet per revolution. And these things are moving, I don't know how many RPMs. It's a, 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 more than I can calculate in my head right now, but <laughs> these things, this one right here can move at about 80 miles an hour, top speed. Props are pretty. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's also, I mean, the first two tell the size, the diameter. Um, the second one gives you the degree. And the, the difference between having a, okay, for an example, like two props versus three, you're going to have more uh, a snappier response with the three, but you're going to be pulling, you're going to be requiring more power. So it's kind of a toss up. Do you want to fly longer? or do you want to fly more agile? Um, and then you have the difference between plastics too. These are bullnose, we both call these the unbreakables. I mean, this one, you can crash them into the ground. You can see, I'm in the process of rebuilding my 210 for spring. So you can see like these, these props are the only ones I used all last year, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, <laughs> but but they can get beat up. I mean, I go and pick this thing up, and this thing will be bent at 90 degrees, and you just bend it back. And that's kind of a bonus that we like in props because we make contact with the ground and trees and, and, and the trees. Road. Yep, I did that. Um, and then there's also the people that prefer the carbon fiber. Um, keep your fingers away from them. Uh, and these are. They give a much, like, you do notice the response. It's a lot snappier. Um, you get a lot firmer control. <coughs> and if you do break these, they can be cracked all the way down, and they will not come off. It's pretty incredible. We were out flying with uh, one of our guys who's in our club, flies with these. And he crashed, flew back up, and we were watching on our goggles. We're like, it seems like it's a little loose in the rear end. And brought it in, and like when he landed it, this prop just was hanging down, but stays in the air. That's good. Yep. So and the carbon fiber ones are more expensive. Prop price is actually you can get them for about a buck a prop, depending on what kind of material you're getting, what type of material that you're they're made of. You can get polycarbonate, you can get mm -hmm. nylon, carbon fiber, all that. It's yep. all it's all preference on how you're flying and what your flying style is. Now we're all, right. To, all right. So batteries. Um, batteries are actually kind of a big deal. Since they are lithium polymer batteries, they are subject to exploding, kind of. I wouldn't say exploding, but if they... Lipo bag. Yep. They, <laughs> if they are punctured, then it is, they will spew smoke and some sort of fire. I haven't experienced it yet, and I don't really want to. But, so there are a lot of numbers you'll see on a lipo. You'll see 200, or 2,200 milliamps. Um, 11.1 volts and 25C. Oh, baseball yeah. Yes, I like this. <laughs> and I'm not being partial, but Tattoo is my battery sponsor, but that's besides the point. So what these numbers mean is there's a C rating and a milliamp rating. 
So the way I'm parading is basically, I'm trying to think. Okay, so my analogy with this is what I tell everybody. Think of the battery like a bottle, and the milliamp is how many fluid ounces you can fit in the bottle. And the C rating is the opening in the bottle on how much can come out at one time. Discharge. Discharge, yes, is what you'd see on this. So with these, these can only handle so many amps and milliamps coming out of it. So if you do exceed that, these will puff up. And once you get a puffy battery, you do have to throw it away, safely discharge it, safely dispose of it because it will start looking like that and it is subject to smoking exploding causing a fire like that but yeah that's the best analogy i could come up with on that and voltage you will see if you look on these there's four little cells and that's what you usually see each cell holds 4.2 volts a piece so you got a four cell that's 14.8 you get three cells that are 11.1 this is a three this is a four and you can get all the way down to a one cell lipo, which literally is 4.2 volts, 200 milliamps. This thing is tiny, but I also fly a tiny drone with it. And that's batteries. Yep. That's it. That's all we've got right now. And now so. onto the Q&A. I know there's a lot of information. That was a lot thrown at you guys at once. So, so sticking with the battery thing, yes. how does that bag it will ruin all your batteries at once instead of your garage. <laughs> so basically, basically, it's like fire retardant. So yeah. the, the fire, it won't burn. It'll keep it safely contained. Yep. When a when a when a lipo burns, it is the biggest mess I've ever dealt with. It's really scary. Too. It's right. lithium yep. polymer batteries are dangerous, yep. but they are a good source of power. Yep. I had one. I had one go in my and I I, I charge everything in the garage, but I did have one go that I was charging for um, one of the guys that we were just bringing into Flight Club and he had let his drain too low. And when the cells get too low, um, just throw them away, man. <laughs> just give, give up. Cause yeah, he, I, I just thought it was low. I plugged it in and luckily we were just out back having a little bonfire. And next thing I know, I noticed like some lights in my garage window and I'm like, that's funny. I don't have anything in there. And it just emits a black soot over everything in like a five foot radius. Mm -hmm. That doesn't come off. Yep, yep. <coughs> My hands were just black for like the next six months. After I've never experienced a lipo fire yet. I'm, at, I'm actually a little, a little scared for that. Oh, I thought you were saying like, no, 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 no. You can do it right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll go fire a nail into one of these. Who brought the nail? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's basically just to protect. Um, when I have them in the house, because I usually, you know, I, I charge outside, but I store them inside. And that's so you can travel around with them and you don't worry about something falling and hitting it or anything like that. You just don't want to take the chance because you can ruin a lot of stuff real fast. Mm -hmm. So, autonomous. Autonomous, it's got to be within line of sight. Um, and you, which means you have to be seeing it. Now, I know. Um, the FAA has allowed some exemptions for that. I know Skyhorse is one company now, they're doing the drone uh, delivery market through, um, I believe it's UPS right now. And I was at um, a truck show last spring and I saw their booth and one of their promotional videos that actually shows the pilot in a room somewhere and I'm like, that's not line of sight. but. So they are allowing some exemptions from that, but you have to prove quite a bit about your um, equipment before they allow for something like that. Um, other regulations, you have to stay under 400 feet. Um, you have to be know. registered. Yeah, you gotta be registered. You gotta have your end number. I anything my, anything over 250 grams has to have the number on it. I actually don't have numbers on these yet, but. You have to have your number on it. You build your own. You gotta apply for the number. Yep. Well, if you do, you pay your five dollars, and I think it's like every three years you renew it. You're given this number. It's like a license plate, basically, and you put it on all of them. Okay. Yep. So if you crash, they can look up your number, and it'll give all your information, basically. Five dollars per drone to register. Nope, five dollars, three years. Any drone you want can be put on. So all it's all the same number. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Unless, unless if it's business, if it's uh, for commercial use then you need to have individually licensed on each one because they have to be named. Mm -hmm. Each drone needs a name. Um, 
found that out with that one. Apparently at Rise Fest, when you're 500 yards off the runway in Sheldon, you need to take care of that. <laughs> I saw a hand back there. I, I was just going to ask about uh, how close you're going to be to the airport. If I can see it, you can't be there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a five miles. Um, from like regional, it's I think like two miles. Yeah. But from like a big airport like Sioux City, um, I used to work for Sabre Tower and Poles, and we were like right off the runway there, and it was like. And now these flight controllers, the big ones like the Pixhawk here, they come automatically with uh, a geo fence on them, where they don't let you. So. <laughs> Yeah, you can talk to the the people there, the people at the airport, and you can get kind of exemptions or permission. Yeah, you have to get. You're asking for. Yeah, it's yeah, it's called a no dam, where basically it's a notice to pilots, mm -hmm. and then like when we were doing Rise Fest, uh, we had a no dam covered from 10:30 to 4 o'clock or to 4:30, and that's when the sun would start to go down too. You can't. You also can't fly at night once the sun's down. Unless you you got to shut down. Yeah, you can if you like. The hobby drones you can fly at night. Um, there's a lot of people that get uh, the infrared cameras um, and lights on them, and it's actually really cool. Night flying is pretty cool. Yep, yep. So. So is that 400 foot ceiling actually in the software? Or is it just no. No. That's just don't do it. I, uh, <laughs> it's I like a speed limit. Yeah, <laughs> I've gotten this. I was out way out in a bunch of cornfields taking aerial video for like property lines and I had to get this up about 500 feet and I was way away from any airports, any airstrips, anything flying in the air, I was way away from it and I will say 500 feet is not line of sight anymore when you can't see no. it and 500 feet up this thing is like that big. So it's kind of scary. You almost lose signal at 500 feet up. Yeah. Luckily they land themselves. Exactly, exactly. So. Anybody can fly the Phantoms. It's it's easy. Within 15 minutes you should be able to fly it pretty easy. Yeah. I should if, say too that it's based off of airspace classification. Spencer is classification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you need to look it up based on the airport. Mm -hmm. I think DJI has no fly zone restrictions. They have yeah. a map that shows how far you can be away from it. You have A, B, C, D, yep. all yep. sorts of different. And, and each airport is different. Kind of rule of thumb though, five miles, two miles, and like something like Spencer here. Also, I think if you're close to the airport, it's like a 50 foot for these hobby drones, which we rarely get over. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you didn't really cover uh, controllers, cost involved. Oh, those. well, it's a lot. I'm glad you asked. No. <laughs> so, this this is the Tyrannix 9XD Plus. This is, none of this is stock. I voided the warranty long ago on this thing. Um, this is $210, just brand new. It flies all of them. It can fly up to 60 models unless you put a new SD card in it, and then it can fly anywhere from 100 models. And if you have that many models, it's, you need to spend your money elsewhere. But um, I actually bought a kickstand for it so I can set it down. This antenna isn't stock. I opened it apart, I unsoldered the RF, antenna that was on it on the RF module and I put a new pigtail on it and I put this 5 dBi antenna so I can get like twice, three times, four times the range depending on how open the area is. And I took the shell off and I spray painted it like a matte chestnut just for aesthetic. That's just me. And you can spend anywhere from 50 bucks to $200. This is the most expensive one you'll ever buy. So $200, that's, that's well, a lot. Yeah, you probably, some people. I mean, sky's the limit. Some people out there have satellites <laughs> hooked up to their yeah. transmitters. But this is just 2.4 yeah. gigahertz, but you can run like, what is it, UHL or UFL? Yeah. You can run that. You can run 433 megahertz. All, But that's ham radio, and I don't want to get into that. But yeah, you can get Spectrum. They're between 100 and 150. That's mm -hmm. pretty cheap. And then you can get into Turnigy, which he's got. Yeah, this is a Turnigy, and nothing on this is stock either. Looks like it, but um, this one I upgraded it to a PPM signal. You can see I got the little got the little mod update there, which basically means I took out the transmitter that comes with it, because with the stock transmitter, this was uh, I want to say I got it for seventy five dollars, 
Um, the module that I got for it was $30, and that turns it into the PPM signal like he has on there, so I can go up to 16 channels. So like my radio, like I can just pull that out. It's not actually part of it anymore. I just keep it in there. I don't know why. Um, so now, instead of having, like in here, I would have a receiver back here, and there'd be eight wires for each channel. Eight servo wires, so three wires per servo. I got like 24 wires all going over there. Now I just have one single wire from my transmitter and I get the two channels. This also has a, has a wire antenna, the reason I went with it, yep. because the other antenna I use conveniently comes with this nice, what we call bobcat on the back end, and every time you crash, it's the first thing to rip off. That's the end of your That's day. That's a hassle. Yeah. So I have, if anybody wants some used receivers, <laughs> I have like eight, nine, ten. So I, don't know, I, got, I got this for you. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> One thing yeah. that makes this it's a $200 worth it is when you turn it on, Welcome to you have a pretty lady that talks to you and tells you what's going on. You can customize. She gets a little naggy after a while. You can, yeah, if you get I'm outside of range, she'll let my, you know. My, mine starts telling me, like, the battery's getting low. <laughs> but you can have this. You can change how the voice sounds, what it says. You can change the little icons for which drone. It's got pages on pages on pages of stuff you can change. And in my opinion, that makes it worth it. But for other people, it's, it's all preference, basically. The, this isn't any better in performance based with like Spectrum. The little cheaper ones, there's not a whole lot of different in performance. They all do the same thing. It's just bells and whistles. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. I like to it just, it's easy. It's all pretty open source. I can change what I want with it. I and I use, it. like, I use one of those for my professional drone. This is, this is for racing because I'm just going to hit too many switches. I don't want to with that one. Yeah, this has, <laughs> I can do up to 32, or not 32, 16, 16 channels. So I can have up to 12 switches doing something. And you got three position switches. Yeah, they're all three position on that. Too. Yeah, it, you can you can do a lot. You can make a drone do some crazy stuff or an airplane. You with 12, 12 aux channels, you can do a lot. <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> Hold my beer, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you build a drone, the component pieces are they connector types, or do you have to do soldering all that stuff? Uh, depends how clean you want it. Um, you know, when I, when I first started building drones, I didn't snip any wires. I plugged everything in with servo connectors. Um, then my drones started getting smaller and I started uh, making my own servo wires so that I could trim them up shorter. And then I just got really good at soldering. And that is a, that's a skill you're definitely going to want to acquire if you're yeah. going to get into building drones. Especially when you get into something this small. Mm -hmm. All of my wires from all of this is under this little canopy right here. This little canopy has probably 30 wires coming off of it, all soldered to a super small board. Do any of DJI support Tom's flight software you can use to work? Yeah, uh, yeah, DJI does waypoint flying and stuff like that. It depends on which one you buy. This one will do it. It's like the lowest model you can buy still on market. Um, I know the brand new Phantom 4 Pros, they do autonomous flying and they have sensors everywhere, so you can't run into stuff. If you wanted to, you, it could run into stuff, but you can do waypoint flying. It pulls up a map on your phone, you press where you want it, how high you want it to go, how fast you want it to get there, and that the, type of stuff. Does it have controls for how far away it will fly from you? Line of sight, and you make it fly out, out of line of sight? You can make it fly out of line yeah. of sight. These ones, I don't even look at them when I fly. I fly these FPV with these goggles. Yeah, there's so, nothing line of sight the way we fly these. This little camera projects to the two little screens in here, and I can fly this as far as this 5.8 gigahertz antenna will let me go. And well, I actually yeah, make my own. This wants a big disconnect from your phone or whatever. <laughs> you fly the waypoints, so and we'll come back. Oh yeah, um, about that. Uh, the way the way this one is programmed is it will it it reads the battery power and it knows how much life it has and it calculates that with the waypoints and its mission that you've assigned it 
And if it gets to a point where the wind is pushing it too much and it's using more battery, it does have fail-safe settings that it, that it will do itself. It, it does not want to kill itself. It will take it directly back to home at the point where the battery is getting to the point of no return. And then you can just put a new battery in and I flip another switch, stand back, and it will go back to where it was and continue the mission. Even if it's disconnected from the controller? Yep, yep. Device. That's what fail safe. Even with these, yeah. you can set fail safe. So if I'm flying so far away behind some trees and I lose signal with my controller, it will just level off and slowly come to the ground. But it also doesn't have sensors on it, so you could go into trees, into lakes, into cars. That's why you just stay away from stuff. Snow banks. Yeah, snow banks. That is, I did that yesterday. When you do the autonomous, can you tell it how high it fly? And yeah. Can you, can you tell it to remain? And, and how much would it shift from where you tell it to remain? And, yeah. um, my, this one holds about a three foot area when I put it into loiter um, mode. And modes is a whole other thing that you could get into. They have probably 50 different modes in Mission Planner. And you can use the different uh, switches on your controller. So you got a three position. And for every position that this goes down, I, get, I have another three position over here where it makes all those a different position. And all those can be assigned to different modes. So when you start thinking about it, you can, you can lose yourself in your switches pretty quick. How much, uh, how much weight could they pull off of them? You wanted to take something up into the sky. That, that is more dependent upon like, how long what, you want to fly. Yeah, what <laughs> motors you have because um, whoa. a motor to prop combo only has so much thrust. So, what are these? These are 1,200, everything's in metric with this stuff. So each of these can do about 1,200 grams of thrust. And this whole quad, so that's, what is it? That's like 4.8 4. Uh, kilograms. And this thing all together with a battery only weighs 600 grams. So it's like, a, it's like an eight to one thrust ratio. So this thing, I could carry some stuff with it. You wanna stay uh, about a four to one thrust ratio. So you want it to be able to have enough thrust to keep it in the air for long enough to where you can actually do something. But yeah, you can lift stuff. Like the 550, the sole purpose of it is to carry a gimbal and a camera, and that camera records what's going on. But they do make them now, obviously, Amazon does the delivery. So they I have, carry boxes yeah. and stuff. I have, I have one at home that it spins uh, 1550 props, uh, split props, it's a RS900, and that one's max weighed out at 45 pounds. So. And so you're saying, you could carry. You're kit. saying oh, if you carry 45 pounds on a calm day, how long could you fly? Probably about five minutes. Yeah. That's like max, and your battery is going to be puffy. Yeah. The the more you're carrying is the more amps you're going to pull. So, so if we wanted to do a pizza delivery, we could probably get a pizza in a 12 pack here, and we'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Pictures or it didn't happen. <laughs> Yeah. On your autonomous rig, did you run just a regular like the SLR on that, or? Uh, this one actually has a 4K GoPro that I just slap on there. You use the E. Yeah. Okay. How much did that one cost to make? This one? Yeah. I'm trying to think like what I tell my wife and what I. Just... <laughs> I would say I'm probably into that for 450. So that's kind of that's a deal. Yeah, that's kind of the benefit of building it yourself. The, that's what this. The new? 500. These. This no, one. Four. The newest one. Oh, 12. 13. Yeah. 12, 13. <laughs> the the Mavic Pros are 11. The Phantom Four. Those Pros ones. Are, do they take themselves off? They land themselves. That one does it too. That yeah, one. They yeah. they just have you know 4K 60 FPS. It has the sonar sensors, so if you want to run into a wall, it won't let you. Yeah, so you no. can't break them. <laughs> You get more bang for your buck building them than what you do. Uh, if 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 you want to learn how to run wish, like mission planner and programming and stuff, which I I enjoy doing, um, it's definitely the way to go. If that's what you're interested in, and you want to make like that custom drum, just the way it is with DJI, you're buying a, you're that buying, drum. You're getting money. Though. Yeah. You're getting your money's worth. But I will yep. say. If I had a choice between building and buying, I'd rather build it because I build my racers. I build all of them from scratch. I calculate what parts go where. 
and why mm -hmm. I need them. And if something goes wrong, like say I blow an ESC or something goes wrong in the flight controller, I know because I put every wire into that thing since it was just parts. And Amazon can fix it for me in two days. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> DJI has a way. Question, yeah. Can you run a separate uh, telemetry radio? Or is it you use it? Me? Yeah. No, the telemetry actually goes through your controller. Exactly. On this, yeah. Uh, I do, it's, it's I do have, hard. yeah, I do have separate uh, telemetry modules that I run on it. This little girl one kind of question. Yeah? Sure. <laughs> right, Adam? Just sign this waiver. Yep. Exactly. exactly. Just sign the waiver and a blank check from your dad. Come on up here, all right? Yeah. Uh, are either of you pro or con with No, you do not need that to race. Um, Part 107 is just for business. Yeah, that's just for business. For racing, so yes. I will say for racing, you do need your FAA registration. So you got to pay the five bucks every three years. And some races, since I go to like, their multi GP is kind of like the the racing program that everybody does. It does require you to have an AMA membership. So it's like 75 bucks a year and it gives you a million dollars worth of insurance basically. So if you crash into a building or a car, it'll pay for it. Yep. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about your racing. Like, where do you go to race? How many competitors? Oh gosh. Is it any, up for bragging rights? Do you have prize money? Oh, do you have spo oh, a sponsor? Got, How many sponsors do you have? Tell us a little bit about the racing aspect. So the racing aspect is it's grown in the past year. They uh, so I race in the Omaha chapter and the Kansas City chapter. So my first race I went to actually last summer, I went down to Kansas City and it's kind of intimidating. We had about 13, 14, 15 pilots and it's kind of complicated when you get into video transmitting because you can't have people on the same RF signal as everybody else. So you that- piss people off if you start stomping on their signal. Exactly. <laughs> it's, I've seen some people get pretty mad, but um, there are prize, prizes. Usually when I go to races, there's small prizes like you win a frame or you win a hat or something. And, but they did have one in Sebring, Florida, is the multi-GP national race, I believe. And the winner received 10 grand. And I think prize, it's, it's just the sponsors for the races and stuff are just mm -hmm. increasing and increasing and the prize money is getting bigger. It's turning into a real sport, basically. Yeah. And most big time racers have anywhere from two to seven sponsors. So some people fly basically for free. It just depends on the company and how generous they are. Yeah. Yeah, and when it comes to like places to race, we're just we're kind of like skateboard punks from California. We just look for any empty backyard with a pool or something like that. But we'll go to like uh, soccer fields. We like going to golf courses too, and we get the opportunity. Um, we've gone. We've done some indoor at some okay. gyms. That was fun. You can do we indoor were, races with these two. Yep. We just, in fact, this last Saturday, Nate and I set up a indoor uh, drone race at the Sioux City Makerspace that they're just trying to start down there. So kind of a little promotion for them. We showed up and they have a, they have a pretty wide open area. So we uh, brought our drones there. We had about eight guys. There were, yeah, seven pilots, I think. Yeah, seven pilots. So um, yeah, we were there from about, geez, 11 to, I bet it was close to Three o'clock. Yeah, we yeah. Got out of there. Um, but typically, I think we kind of meet. Um, each each pilot has their favorite course, and next season we're going to be doing a lot of rotation between like mm -hmm. North Sioux, Lamar's, Orange City, um, Sioux City, um, and just kind of where our pilots in the club want to mm -hmm. want to come from. And with racing, so when you race, you have gates, which are basically. Like I use PVC and pool noodles because pool noodles are kind of forgiving if you hit them. Um, it's a five foot by five foot cube basically or a square. And you have to fly through those as kind of checkpoints. And then you have big flags that indicate, you know, turning points. And there are times where you have to like go over a gate, flip upside down and go through. But you have to hit every single gate and go through the finish gate and then get like your time. And whoever does fastest, fastest lap usually wins or most laps done in two minutes and stuff like that. Races are pretty hardcore depending on where you go to. So this, you, have, you have a buddy that's a ref then? You have some refs? They do, usually the I host. mean, everybody's watching your goggles, mm -hmm. so if you skip a gate, there's gonna be some, hello! Yeah. Something like that, I mean. You, 
you know. <laughs> you're required to have a spotter. Yeah. So somebody that's watching you fly line of sight and somebody that he can also look in goggles. And if you do miss a gate, you have to turn around and go through it, make sure you hit every gate. Yep. yep. And uh, this season, kind of something Nate and I are working on for our club is we are going to get uh, introduced to telemetry. Or, uh, no, what's... Race band? Yeah, race. Well, the, the transponder. Yes. Transponders. So we'll have a gate and we got, we found a project, it's all open source. Uh, but yeah, it's the Arduino board and a pie and you can make a transponder gate, which is your finish line. And then every, every quad will get a little transponder chip on it, which goes to your flight controller. That's why this one I'm, I'm uh, trying out a new flight controller because we want to find one for the club that is transponder capable. Um, our old ones that we were using aren't, so right now I think we got a Kumboni. Kumbini, yeah. yeah, yeah, Kumbini flight controller that we're going to try. So then, I mean, as soon as you go through the gate, we can start overlaying our videos with like your time, your lap time, where the other pilot is at. So we're trying to Basically, beef up that area. it gives you a number, your transponder has a number, everybody's got a different number, and your number is linked to a name, and when you go through that gate, it tells you like, so-and-so has finished at this fast of a lap on their first lap. And then you go through the track, come back. They finished their second lap at this time. Their fastest lap is this. Maybe it's the whole, like, somebody having to do a timer. And it makes it pretty fair. For and, it, and, it, and it also, the nice thing about this Arduino and Pi combo uh, one, is it'll keep track of our league online. Mm -hmm. So we just have a website, and it'll tell, like, how they did that day. It'll tell them, like, their fastest lap at what course we were at and stuff like that. So that's kind of something that we're looking forward to. We're definitely trying to keep up with the, the rest of everybody. Yeah, and that's pretty hard because it is a pretty fast growing industry. It's crazy. From where I started to where I am now, it's mm -hmm. insane. Oh, yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. Are there any drone simulators to like yes. oh, the end of winter you can practice? I have, I have two. Yeah, I do uh, one of the ones, uh, lift off. Sure which is through stream. Um, if you guys have a stream account for online video games, Liftoff is a pretty good one. Um, that you can, um, you can actually plug your controller into your computer with that, so you can like use all your own settings. And uh, DRL, the Drone Racing League, they have an online simula simulator that you can download, and you can actually, in both these programs, um, you can change out your motors to the actual motors you use and the ESCs to the actual ESCs that you use, flight controller, even down to the battery. So you can be flying the drone that you want before you even go out and buy the parts. Okay. Yeah, that's that's something. Cool. I, I think the physics on it, you know, going from flying freestyle on this to flying freestyle on a simulator, it's, the physics are weird. Like I've been flying simulators for the past two months now, and then I went and flew this yesterday. It's different. The reason I ask is, for example, say you decide you want to build a drone. Yeah. Would it make sense, knowing nothing about parts, to sit down in the simulator, build a drone, see how well you fly it, yeah. find what you're flying the best, then go out and buy those actual parts to put together your drone? Yes and no. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll explain that. When I fly the simulator, I'm not paying for the parts, I just hit restart. <laughs> <laughs> I do pretty good on the simulator. When I'm flying this, I'm like, do a barrel roll. I don't need to do two though. <laughs> so, so let's that's, say you keep tricks out of yep, it and you're just trying keep to tricks out of it. If you want to learn uh, the DRL simulator, I would, I would say it would be the best one. It's got pretty good physics. You can tweak and it's, it to how and you it's like got it. A, uh, it's got a training course. Like before you actually get into the flying and stuff, you have to go through a training course. It teaches um, you hovering. And it'll work with pretty much all of those remotes. Yeah, yep. well, you can also get it just for a regular PS, um, Xbox, PS4, PS4, Xbox. It's got, you know, USB 2.0 yeah. connector that plugs straight into your computer and stuff like that. It's The physics are definitely weird because I fly really good on the simulator, and then I go to integrate those tricks into actually flying, and I just crash out, basically. Yeah, simulators don't have 10 mile per hour wind or a sudden <laughs> gust from over here. So yep, yep. that would be the difference. But if you want to... No, if you're going to be a good drone pilot, definitely get a simulator like DRL. But bes besides a simulator, where's the little whoop I have? Oh, this this is the perfect way to know how well you're yeah. going to fly. This is like 60 bucks. 
I put this together myself. And you can get, these are the higher end goggles, but you can get goggles for about $70. Mm -hmm. And you won't break this. This is the one drone you can buy that you really won't break unless you really want to. I, I fly this every day and I have yet to break anything on it. Not but it's, it's good, yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's good practice though. It's really good yeah. practice. But yeah, any other, yeah. The technology on your <clears throat> goggles, do you have like any fade out or anything or is it is it like is it is it like watching your big screen TV on mm -hmm. it or I have experimented a little bit on some a lot of older technology, mm -hmm. so it's like turning corners, it cuts out and stuff on it. It I will say there is a very predetermined range with these. I actually build my own antennas because I can tune them to the point where I get really good range on them. But if you slowly run out of that range, so like this, think about this as having a big ball on it. It's an omnidirectional antenna. And this one has a ball on the end of it. So once these two like signals go away from each other, you're gonna see nothing but static. And as you slowly get away from that, you'll start to see more and more static. It's not just instant. You slowly get more static. And when you fly behind stuff, you'll notice that there's obstacles. And you'll see static, basically. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Or you'll just get like horizontal static, basically. You can tell you're... Yeah. <laughs> Flip it over. <laughs> and he's out of his chair. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I mean, you're not... Some of the videos that you see online when they're showing like their freestyle stuff, they have a GoPro strap to the top. That's not what you see through this. It's all, all <laughs> it's, HD footage. You, yeah. Th these things aren't reliable enough to do good freestyle. This is actually a new camera. It's actually probably the highest resolution that you can get for FPV. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good example of what you see. Mm -hmm. So your professional opinion. <laughs> that's you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not talking about professional opinion, okay. like actually commercial use. Um, the Phantom 4, yeah. you wanted to build the equivalent that. So like you said, fix it in two days. Mm -hmm. What would your estimated cost be to come close to building that on your, out of your own building? Ooh, I'd say about two. Well, if you want to do a Phantom 4 and you want the sonar, the acoustic, uh, GPS, light bridge, Wi Fi to yeah. your phone, um, probably looking around seven, Thank seven to know. eight if you're looking for like $1,300 on a DJI. $7,800? No, no, seven to eight. Hundred dollars. Yeah, but not that one. Seven hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, that drone. It depends, though. You could spend anywhere. Like, if you want to build them yourself, you can spend anywhere from four hundred dollars to like five to ten grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't need any other gold. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. But building an equivalent to a DJI is actually kind of hard because it's all proprietary. None of this is open source. Right. All of the, the ESCs, the flight controller, the PDB is all one circuit board. They've gotten it down to a science where they can all have it one circuit board. It all works together. It's super cheap. But if something breaks. If something breaks, you have no idea what broke, basically. You have, to, you have to send it back in. I have a general idea of how to fix them, but nothing too intense. Yeah, there's nothing that I've had break that I can't tell is about to break as well. Right. Like I can I can feel in my flying if I have an ESC that's not functioning well. I can also tell when I have a motor that's not performing as it should. Yeah. That's just something that I get out of building it myself too. Is I spend a, like a lot of hands-on programming it and just getting it fine-tuned and I'm allowed to do like that. that. Something like that probably a week. Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, if I have all the parts right in front of me and my soldering iron's ready, I, let's, say you, let's say you didn't have to go to work. You could just sit down and build one. A day. Oh, a day. A day. Okay. Seven hours at most. Sure. I can build one of these in an hour if I have all the parts ready and tinned and everything. Any more questions? Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Oh, yeah. Hey, thanks, guys.